um, you know, there was sort of an incredible bounty of low-hanging fruit um, to be collected, and the low-hanging fruit was absolutely worthwhile um, and tasty and nutritious, um, but also a sense that uh, um, we shouldn't just keep uh, holding ourselves uh, to the standard of finally getting the data out of the system um, or finally running a clustering algorithm over it, um, but every year um, we should uh, be more ambitious about the kinds of research that we expect, um, that, it should be, that it should be asking harder and more important questions, that there should be ever tighter connections um, between the um, powerful techniques computer scientists can bring um, and the theories and ideas and frameworks that learning scientists can bring, um, that our work should be um, going beyond the observational um, to different approaches to experimental understanding, to causal inference, to new kinds of learning design. Um, and uh, our hope, our, 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 our hope very much is that you'll have a chance um, in the conference time that we have together um, to be able to see a bunch of work that really adheres to that high standard. Um, and you'll get to see this afternoon in the poster session and demonstration session, um, lots of different examples of, of budding work along the same lines. Um, we're incredibly grateful to all of you, um, especially those of you who came from far, far away um, to be here. We know that it is increasingly difficult um, to make your way into the United States of America, and so while we're all still able to do so, um, it's great to have you all here. Um, and uh, um, I'm really looking forward to a really stimulating couple of days. We tried to design an agenda um, with lots of time for people to connect, um, plenty of tea breaks. Um, we'll have some community conversations that we'll describe later this afternoon where we have a chance to talk to one another. We have a long poster session um, where we can talk to people who are doing some really exciting uh, work on the frontiers of the field. And, uh, and hopefully those interactions will be as valuable as anything that you see here in this session. Um, uh, the person who's probably done the most work um, to pull this event together is the uh, general chair, um, Claudia Urea, um, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce her, to tell you a little bit more about the conference, and to welcome our keynote speaker this morning. Thank you, Justin. Um, well, I just want to welcome everyone. I probably email. Um, every one of you, uh, so it's great to finally see you all here, and it's been great to work with Justin and Candace to put this agenda together. Um, as Justin mentioned, we have a number of sessions. We have uh, papers organized in six sessions. Uh, three of them will happen today, and then three of them will happen tomorrow, so um, we don't want to spend too much time. Um, but I just want to welcome um, our keynote today, uh, so it's a pleasure and honor to uh, welcome, Roar Salzburg, um, with a thank you, because it was the first uh, person who said yes, uh, so it was the first person we had in the list of participants. Um, I met Roar a couple of years ago, and um, since then I bump into him in, in several um, academic um, events, and it's always a pleasure to talk to him. I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about um, Broerg. Uh, he's a chief learning officer, a Kaplan, or chief learning engineer. Um, as I've heard himself um, describe his role. Um, he's in charge uh, of research and application of innovative uh, evidence-based learning strategies, technologies, and um, products across uh, Kaplan. Um, he's also um, in charge of maintaining consistency through all of the standards um, of Kaplan uh, offerings for students of all ages. Um, Broer has been in many uh, organizations. He was in um, K-12, he's been in McKinsey, he's been in the publishing industry. Um, just wanna say that um, he represents not only um, expertise in you know, learning online and also face-to-face, -face, but also in different um, stu you know, students um, of different ages. So um, I think it's you know, his expertise and what he brings today is really relevant to this community. Um, Broer has a BA in mathematics and a, um, also a degree in um, electrical engineering from University of Washington. Uh, he has a, a master's in mathematics from Oxford University. He has a PhD from electrical engineering and computer science from MIT, so we're also welcoming an alumni to MIT. So thank you, Broer. Um, finally, I don't wanna miss that, but you have so, you also have a doctor degree, um, so. Just don't need to say more, but welcome, Broer, to, to the conference. <laughs> yes, I will claim the title uh, Chief Learning Engineer here for Kaplan, even though such a thing doesn't exist, but I think we should start trying to see if we can find people who do that work. Now, I need a clicker. There it is. Yes. Fabulous. 
Okay, so um, I'm gonna tell you a, a little bit about uh, our own journey, Kaplan's journey towards being a learning engineering organization. So we'll start from some learning science fundamentals, and then we'll work our way through how did we do some of that work at scale, and then we'll spend some time on actually how do you make a transformation at scale? So Kaplan works at scale. Um, uh, we have operations all around the globe that do different kinds of learning. Many of you know us for our test prep work, but that's a, a quarter of our revenues these days. We deliver higher education degrees, we deliver workplace training, we do English language learning, and we do it around the globe, Singapore, Australia, the UK, some outposts in Africa and Asia. And you know, across all those different areas, um, when I came in, uh, they couldn't talk to each other. We had reproduced the chaos of the entire education industry inside Kaplan because the higher ed guys couldn't talk to the test prep guys, the test prep guys couldn't talk to English language learning, English language learning couldn't talk to corporate training, and it had all been fine because they were all different businesses. But it was our then new CEO, Andy Rosen, who looked around and said, blindingly important insight, all these people have brains. Aren't we training? one brain at a time? Why do we need so many user manuals for brains? Why can't we have just one way of looking at how learning works across Kaplan? And the key reason they ended up with me is instead of picking one of the many mythologies they already had, because higher ed had a mythology and heck, Kaplan invented the test prep mythology and you have you know, mythologies in corporate training and so forth. Instead, uh, they decided to ground it all on learning science. And that's what I began doing then about seven, eight years ago was helping Kaplan transform itself uh, over to this. And so th the way we approached it at one level is fairly simple. We wanted to really put evidence to work. So we wanted to start from how learning actually seems to work. So let's go read some of this literature. Who here knows who Richard Mayer is? See, now this is a different audience. This is great. How about John Sweller? Raise your hand if you know who John Sweller is. Yeah, see, this is fabulous. Many of the audiences that I go to to talk about this thing, this, this stuff, they've never heard of those guys, right? They don't know any of those folks. They don't know Dick Clark, and, and it's odd because they're very interested in learning, but they've never plugged into the learning science. This is really cool that we are in a different place, uh, both literally and figuratively. So starting from how learning actually works, and then you know, use technology to implement the good solutions, because technology will implement bad solutions with just as much facility. Imagine for a moment your worst ever college professor used to only be able to damage a few thousand students per year. Now, with the glories of open ed resources and video available in Kazakhstan 24-7, that person can destroy the hopes and dreams of millions of students. Win for technology, yes? No, disaster, right? Because technology doesn't care. It makes anything you want to put on it more affordable, more reliable, more available, more data rich, more personalized. It'll do that for bad stuff too. So you've got to start with the good stuff and then get that out through technology. Use evidence. Generate evidence and use additional evidence to make progress. Don't just guess whether it's working. Actually measure. And then finally, think about how to change these practices at scale. I mean, it's great that we are now beginning to see onesie, twosie kinds of initiatives, and people are trying this in their own classrooms, but there's a whole different world of work, which really is engineering work, to say, how do I do this across dozens of classes, hundreds of them, at the same time? So Kaplan University, one of our online universities, we have a 1,000 courses that we are transforming into learning engineering, competency-enabled modules. Right? Now, working on a thousand things at once, that's a whole different exercise than let's try something in one place. So that's part of what I'm going to talk to you about. So this is the whole learning engineering kind of work that we've been doing across Kaplan, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. So um, it, it requires work, real work, to do this. And the way I'm going to explain it and the way we've done it uh, over these many years, and hopefully others can do this faster <laughs> than we were able to do it, um, you start by exposing people to the opportunity. Because a lot of folks just have no idea that they could materially improve learning performance. It's not that they don't want to, they just don't have any idea that it could be done. So you start by exposing folks, getting some examples, some points on the board. Then you gotta educate people. 
you got to really start giving them the grounding to say, this is how it can be done. This is what you need to do tomorrow before you go home at 6 p.m. And it's got to be practical uh, work. And frankly, it has to take into account that all the people you're talking to, they have brains too. There's research about this. Even faculty members, they have brains. I mean, I, you know, come, come up to me after if we need more work on this. But I, I trust me, it's true. And so their learning of a brand new way of approaching learning is going to go through all the Kubler-Ross stages of grief that students go through when they discover how ignorant they are, OK? And so you got to manage that as you work with all the human beings in the process. So education is non-trivial. It's not just sending out memos. And then you got to bear down and put some effort in. And there are several kinds of effort. There's communication effort, but there's also management effort. Now, I know that's an odd thing in universities, but even there, thinking that through is a piece of this. How do you actually get resources and money aligned with a large-scale project like this once you have enough people who know what they're doing? Um, and then finally, some evaluation cycle that can start up along the way, where you begin to make this normal and natural to begin to review and identify where you're not where you ought to be and keep going from there. So I'm going to talk about each of these in the context of how we've done this work. So the first part is exposure. So exposure to what? Well, show the science, show some processes, make examples, right? So that's how we got started with all this stuff. So uh, I, I, there are many of you who actually have degrees in cognitive science in the room, so I don't actually have to give you a degree in cognitive science here. But a, a simple model that we've been working with, um, which is much simpler than the models that are out in the research line, but are simple enough to communicate across our organization, is to think about working memory and long-term memory as two very different kinds of uh, machinery inside people's minds. Working memory has these characteristics. It's the verbal part. It's slow. It makes a lot of mistakes. But it is also the most flexible part of our minds. And it's where you have to really run practice and feedback to actually master things. You have to do that through your working memory. Because when it's new to you, working memory is what's going to try to wrestle with it and figure it out. Working memory is then supported in an almost infinite bandwidth way by other resources that are available from long-term memory, which has very different characteristics. That things last for a long time, by the name, but also it can run many things in parallel. It can be very fast. And if it's trained correctly, it can be nearly error-free compared to working memory, which just makes a lot of mistakes. And you just have to expect that when you're stumbling along the first time through. Um, it is nonverbal, which is incredibly inconvenient for learning engineering. Because the experts who have a ton of stuff, like more than 70% of what they know how to do, is in long-term memory. It's obvious. It's free. So they don't tend to explain it in detail to novices. And in fact, you know, one of the best parts of doing instructional design process is when your subject matter expert storms out declaring the instructional designer is an idiot because they just don't get the simplest things. And now you know you're getting to about the right level. Because what is obvious to that expert, it requires some pulling and questioning to make it become verbal so that a non-expert can actually unpack it and understand it. So it's really irritating that long-term memory wakes, that works the way it does. And there's a lot about human learning that is inconvenient and irritating. Whoever designed this thing needs to be taken outside for a whacking, it must be said. But it is what it is, right? And we got to design for the system however inconvenient it is. And this is an important point. We should not be designing learning for how we wish learning worked. And way too often. That's what people do in ed tech, in publishing houses, and faculty, et cetera, is, and teachers. We, you know, we wish learning did certain things. It doesn't. So we got to pay attention to the evidence. So these are very different things. And the way you get things into long-term memory pretty much is you got to do almost all of it with working memory. you got to practice and feedback and keep going and so forth. So this has profound implications for how you design your learning environments. Another piece that has come out of research more recently is work on motivation. And this is from a scan that uh, Dick Clark, uh, who's a very good cognitive scientist from USC, did for us a couple of years ago, uh, looking at behavioral economics, social psychology, motivational psychology, cognitive psychology, some other areas, trying to come up with a bit of a synthesis of, uh, around the motivation work that's been published with many different languages and words in many different sectors. Um, and the basic idea here is, 
we're on the way to trying to get good results, which could be good work results, it could be you know, great practice results, it could be fluency with what we're doing. We're after that. So the question is, how do we get students to start, persist, and put in mental effort into well-designed learning environments? And that was the definition of motivation that, that Dick was using, is what gets in the way of starting, persisting, and putting in mental effort? You'll notice liking is not on that list, right? Because it's like working the muscles, the Carol Dweck analogy, right? That if you start, persist, and put in mental effort on well-designed learning activities, your brain will change. Now, one of the reasons you might do it, as we'll see in a second, is you like the activity, but it's, it, it's not necessary if you get in there and do it, uh, just like you know, practicing for arts or dance or other things, that doing the right things and working your way through them, taking the feedback, processing it, and so forth, you will get stronger and better, and, and uh, that's just as true for neurons, too, it turns out. Okay, so when he did this scan, what he found was four different things that go wrong with motivation, and this is a piece that hasn't been written up yet, and he and I are working on writing this up, so we will hopefully come out later this year. Wh one is, you don't value what you're doing or how you're doing it. So you're a dancer in an algebra class, and what am I doing here? I want to think about Swan Lake. I don't want to think about you know, quadratic equations. So to treat that motivation problem, you need to find links between a dancer's interests and algebra or modeling or something, whether it's about dance foundations or buying dance equipment, something that links. Um, stories of people who were artsy, who then got interested in analytics, uh, in, you know, for their improving their performance or something like that. There's ways to do it, but you need to draw that link. Another problem is self-efficacy, where you just, another dancer, same algebra class, and I'm in there and I'm thinking, I can't do math. I'm no good at it. Well, it doesn't help to come bustling up to me and talk about how important it is for me to run a dance foundation someday when my dance career is over, when I just can't do math. So you're just making me miserable, right? My life is over, right? This is not helpful. You need another approach. You've got to refuse to go along with the idea that you can't do math, back the person up, find the math they can do, work their way forward, and again, show them stories of others who thought they couldn't do it that are like you, and show how they were, and have them talk about how they were able to work through it. Very different treatment for a very different problem. The third one is you blame things in your environment. So yeah, I could do it, but my teacher hates me. I don't understand my TA. Or uh, a classic one is I don't have time. I just don't have enough time. Or I don't have a place to work that's quiet, right? So I can't start, I can't persist, I can't put in mental effort, you know, done. Again, it's a, actually a problem solving solution. You sit down, you say, hmm, you don't have a quiet space. Well, let's look where you are, what's around you, let's figure out. Is there a place you can be? You don't have enough time. Let's look at your schedule and try to figure out how to put time back into your schedule for this important work. And part of what you're doing with these problem solving actions is to model. You can do this for yourself, that it is not a reason to stop. It is possible to problem solve through this. The last one that uh, Dick found in his scan, which is by far the hardest, uh, are negative emotional states. If you're angry, depressed, scared, you're not going to start, persist, and put in mental effort. I mean, it's just you're distracted, you know, your mind is elsewhere, et cetera. And honestly, all the other things, they may be going on, but treating those isn't going to help if you've got this negative emotional state that's completely blockading you. So that's social services and all the complex stuff you can imagine. That's why that one's a really hard one. But it is its own separable thing that you've got to be aware of before you get started. So, so this kind of work, drawing on empirical literature about cognition and cognitive processes and motivation and motivation processes, really does provide some fuel for an engineering approach. So the way we thought about it was, uh, at Kaplan, uh, was to say, let's make this into a kind of a cycle, a process that we can explain to everyone, all the different kinds of learning environments we have, whether they're higher ed or test prep or corporate training. And it begins by understanding expertise. What are the actual learning outcomes that you can do? And I'll be honest, we have not been as successful at unpacking long-term memory of expertise as I would like. That remains one of my losses in life. I'm not there yet. I'm just being honest because engineering is about compromise and you can't do everything you want and some stuff you can't get at. And this is an example for me of an engineering compromise where we have good robust conversations with subject matter experts, 
but they're not at the level of what we know how to do and have even done some examples of, which is real cognitive task analysis. It's just very expensive, so unusual to do it in an education setting that it's hard to get it going at scale. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk too much more about CTA. I'm gonna talk about the other things much more today. So but once you have a set of outcomes that you really like, then you gotta design your learning environments to try to get as many people as you can successfully to those outcomes. And that's where evidence-based instructional design comes in um, and drawing off the research literature. And I'll talk more about that. You also have to make sure you're measuring well. And I think this is one of the uh, dangerous areas for our whole uh, industry right now. There's a lot of excitement for good reason around rich statistical analyses of patterns emerging from interaction data with machines and systems. And, and you know, creating adaptive learning environments that speed up and slow down or even diagnose and go backwards. Uh, and, and creating, you know, then patterns of students who may benefit from certain kinds. The problem is, if all of that is based on bad learning data, it's all gonna be a tower of oatmeal. It's not going to lead to happy progress. It will be a pile of mush. And I don't think there's enough people either who understand how validity and reliability are determined for learning outcome measures or who even want to do that sort of work. It's, it's different. It's not the same as the exciting work of focusing on practice and feedback and VR efforts and all that. And yet without really solid grounding, you could easily end up thinking you have a great solution for chemistry when what you've really been doing is trying to solve a reading problem. Because often complex problem solving tasks end up being more a result of the reading skills of the person than their actual abilities to handle the learning outcome you were after. And you don't know it if you don't actually probe and test and really look carefully at it. So this is a really important issue and I'll come back to some of that later on. And then finally, especially with technology enhanced environments, one of the really promising things you can do is start to rapidly pilot things. It's very hard to make systematic changes to teachers and faculty, uh, small changes, because they, you know, they're human beings. It's just tough, they're, they're busy and they get distracted. It's hard for them to reliably do something new uh, over and over again. That's where the things that we're using technology for, now we have test beds that we can try. And I'll show you some examples of how we've been doing that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about evidence-based instructional design real quickly. Again, many of you are already aware of these, so I'll go fairly fast through this. So for some of the, from the research on learning, what you see is you tend to go through these three stages as you master something. Your first stage, you're stumbling around. You don't really know what's going on. It's very hard. And basically, everything is stuck in working memory. You've got nothing in long-term memory to help. And the result is, stuff keeps falling out. You keep looking back the page before, trying to remember what the heck was that. And, uh, you, you, know, uh, and, and it, you feel like an idiot, right? So imagine six-year-olds spend their whole lives like that, right? It's just that's how it is. Well, yeah, it's hard, right? But after a while, you start to make some progress. Um, oh, I should say, so what do you do for that? Well, one of the ways to help at that early stage when it's only working memory that's really active is you make things be pretty visual and pretty easily accessible. Visual job aids, things that are spread out in front of you so your eyes can bounce around and fill in those gaps as they fall out of working memory. Well, as you get a little bit better, now you're getting a little more fluent. You recognize things. You don't have to look everything up to, to remind yourself. You've got some pieces that are still resident there. This is the place at which uh, 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 you know, uh, varied kinds of practice tasks over the same things will really help you master and stretch your understanding and the generalization of what you're doing. It's also the place where, where feedback is probably most likely to be helpful. Because in the first declarative stage, working memory is so overloaded you can't think about feedback and do the work at the same time very effectively. Whereas here, you can begin to hold in working memory, yeah, what did he just say or what did she just say about how you should do it while you're actually trying to do the next stage. So, and then finally, you know, for some things, not everything, that's an important point, some things can just go into long-term memory and, and to get there, you gotta just repeated practice and feedback. But not everything can go in there to long-term memory. Just for fun, I'll, I, I'll, I'll do this little exercise. Some things can go completely into long-term memory. Who here drives a car? Raise your hand. Ah, see, we've done the awake test. The evidence is in. Okay, two. Um, 
So uh, who of you have had this experience? You set out for place A, and then you start thinking about MIT and work and life, and you look up, and you're at place B instead. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Look around. You're not crazy. Not for that reason. OK, right? So there you go. So it, it, in fact, you know, and I, we, I just laugh, and I do the same thing, and I just say, oh, I, I put in the wrong program card, and I, you know, I go off to wherever I was. I usually end up at a place, a caffeine stop of some kind. And, and what we don't do is think enough about, well, who drove you to the wrong place? Who was in charge of a ton of metal going at 10, 20, 50 miles an hour? Because you were thinking about something completely different. Right? This is a little worrying. Now, when you're driving home tonight, look left and look right. Who's driving those cars? Because it ain't who's going to get out and talk with you at the fender bender. Right? Well, the cognitive scientists have found, yeah, lots of expertise goes into long-term memory, can become automated. And it's not simple stuff. It's complex, extended decision making that runs in long-term memory. It's pretty exciting when you think about it. But not everything does. So for example, you can plan your summer vacation while you're driving to work. right? You will never be able to plan a persuasive essay uh, uh, and plan your summer vacation at the same time. Right? Because planning a persuasive essay, working a persuasive essay, requires working memory. It's a very hard thing. It always uses complex, creative problem solving that builds on components in, 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 uh, in long-term memory. But it won't ever leave working memory just completely alone to do something else. So there's plenty of stuff that requires the coordination between working memory and long-term memory. But you do need to get some stuff into long-term memory to really facilitate. OK. Um, I chart. This is just a pointer at uh, some of the great learning research that's been done by Richard Mayer and John Sweller and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, there's a great book, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, by Ruth Clark and uh, Richard Mayer, if you haven't heard of it, that summarizes a whole range of results. They keep updating it. I think they're on their fourth edition now. Um, and it's actually a handbook for learning engineers, for instructional designers. It's not a monograph for researchers. It really is designed to point to how do you do it. And there's great things on here, like avoiding irrelevant graphics and uh, using informal language, and, 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 and then backed up by experimental uh, you know, science. Now, these are laboratory results, right? And so just like in any other science thing, your mileage will vary when you get out in the field. But my thinking is I'd rather start from a standard deviation or more of power and lose some of that in the course of trying to get into a regular you know, live setting then start from nothing or you know, no evidence at all. And again, I'll just run through this really quickly. You know, what does it mean to have a standard deviation? If you get a full standard deviation of movement, you're going from a median performer. They, you can move them to an 84th percentile kind of performance. So it's non-trivial. And some of these things on that list, uh, like removing distracting graphics, they actually save money. So the learning engineering work based on evidence, it's not about spending more all the time. It's about spending smarter, which is why it really lets you think about it as an engineering discipline and, and as a benefit to large organizations that are trying to be careful with the resources that you can make smarter decisions about what to do next. Um, and uh, you know, this comes from a few years ago. This is work that we did as an example. It was one of our very first randomized controlled trials where we were trying to see, can we see an impact of this kind of uh, learning science in the wild? So we teach the LSAT. We're very good at that. We've been doing it for a long time, the law school admissions test. There's a very nasty part of the LSAT called the complex reasoning problems. They're, they're horrible, nasty little logical stems and distractors. And, and we're very good at teaching for that. So when the multimedia stuff came along, we said, no problem. We will make the Kaplan video on solving the LSAT logical reasoning problems, and a workbook. Yeah, and our work here is done. Well, one of our learning engineers who had just been trained about all this stuff recognized, well, wait a minute. This kind of really complex problem solving that totally overloads working memory, that's got to be one of those things that John Sweller has been working on for years. Worked examples looks like a solution to that kind of a problem. So he said, I think worked examples will work better. And he was laughed at. He said, come on, video, video is so cool. We know video is great. Well, being Kaplan, we actually ran a randomized controlled trial um, with several hundred students in it. And 
So this, this is, again, this is engineering, so stuff doesn't work, okay? So on the far right is no instruction whatsoever, okay? Just next to it, just left to it, is what you never want to see from a test prep company, which is the video plus workbook. My marketing colleagues tell me, Kaplan, worse than nothing, is, doesn't really sing. I mean, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. We, we can do a vote, but I, I don't think I'm going right, to be helpful. Now, the good news is, when you do the statistics, the two right-hand bars are the same, OK? Kaplan, as good as nothing. Huh? Huh? No, no, no. We don't get the lights in the eyes of you know, our happy customers yet, right? So this was not a happy story, right? Because everyone was sure video was so cool. It was going to work. And we did a workbook. Well, there worked examples. We made 15 of them. And we didn't know how many we needed to let students wrestle with, so we gave half of them, uh, we gave half the group uh, with worked examples, we gave half that group eight, we gave half 15, we didn't know. The two left-hand bars are statistically the same, so that means eight worked examples was good enough. And it is statistically actually quite a bit improved over the, the, <clears throat> the other ones, not to say our original designs, but there we are. So, but there's more to this puzzle. So look at the time spent. The video plus workbook, professionally produced by our expert instructors, more than an hour and a half of work versus eight minutes of worked example practice. So it's, it was really confusing, right? Because, oh, the last thing is, these were eight PowerPoint slides, people. Cost of production like one one hundredth the cost of you know, an hour long video plus a workbook, right? So it's just a horrible conundrum for the development staff, right? Because it costs less, it takes much less time for students, and it works better. What are we supposed to do? Because video is so cool. Well, yeah, they got it. It was like, oh my gosh. So they now, at Kaplan Test Prep, their development cycle begins by looking for learning science for any of the things that they're trying to solve, whether it's a topic or whether it's a type of instruction that they want to go after, because this, this shocked them, because they were so sure that they knew what they were doing. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but <clears throat> that, that's the challenge. So this point example in our at scale organization led to real insight that, man, we got to do something. And that's very important to find those diamonds you can crack. And the result was startlingly big. And that helped people recognize we have to pay attention to this. Um, we've done work on motivation, too. This is recent work, actually, like literally in the last six weeks, I think, where um, we, we uh, uh, looked at this is at Kaplan University, where we were looking at students. and trying to help them pass and persist onwards. Kaplan University has a community college-like population of students. They are older, they work, uh, they're often single with kids. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, life happens, and so it's hard for them to get all the way through a program. So helping them to really stick to it is a very valuable thing to do. And this is based on some research done elsewhere, uh, I think related to some of the Carol Dweck work. But this is about, this particular flavor is about having students describe in their first couple of weeks of a difficult course um, for another student to come behind them, how does this make you unique? How does doing well on this course make you unique in a couple of different flavors? And, you know, and writing it for that next student. That's what it's for. It's for the next student, right? And as you do that, it turns out the research has shown in other areas, especially more conventional universities with 18 to 20-year-olds who come from uh, difficult backgrounds, it lifts their, uh, their performance and lifts their willingness to stick around. And what we found doing a randomized controlled trial here with uh, 700 or so students, um, that it, it actually worked out. It actually lifted both uh, the, uh, uh, the pass rates and the uh, persistence rates substantially. So this is a thing that we're rolling out. It's very exciting. Right? Now, I'll show you a slide later that shows most of the stuff we've done has failed. Right? And I want to show you that because that's what engineering looks like. And educators get too scared of good failure. They think it's bad to fail at all. 
And of course, I'm not saying let's celebrate you know, screwing up kids' lives. That's not what I'm saying. But to make progress, whether it's in medicine or in engineering, other engineering disciplines, or in learning, you've got to test promising things. But you have to test them, and then you may have to tinker. Right? And I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. But tinkering is really important. But I wanted to show you these are success things. Right? This is like, woohoo! This is, fuels the motor when people say, whoa, so you can increase retention rates and pass rates by doing this. This came from the science literature. Can I get some more science literature, please? And it's like, yeah, maybe if you're nice to me. We'll give you some more science literature. Right? So um, another example of this uh, on the assessment side okay, is uh, looking at faculty-based assessments, informally done. So this was from English composition, where we, had, we took a sampling of papers uh, from uh, a writing course. The left-hand bar is the average mark from the teachers themselves. And on the right are two different composition teachers who didn't know the students, who used the same rubric, and marked them. And those two on the right are statistically the same. OK, now if you're looking at this, you got to think, Houston, we have a problem. Because if you want to use this as an end metric for a randomized control trial on lifting student performance, boy, does this uh, you know, fail the reliability test. The thing you don't know is exactly what the problem is. Now, there's a natural temptation to leap to a conclusion, which is, oh, those teachers. They're putting their thumb on the scale for their own students because they love them or because they want to look good, and so they're biasing upwards. That's the natural inclination. But in fact, you don't know that. It could be the rubric is so awful that the only way to give an accurate mark is if you know the full corpus of the student's work. And that without that, you're lost at C, and the rubric doesn't help, and it's a disaster. Right? So all you know from this data is we have a problem with our assessments. You don't know yet what the solution is. And that's what we dug into and begun to do work on and all this kind of stuff. So the assessment side, too, this is the point that in, you know, People don't think they have a problem with assessments until they look at the data. And I'll show you some more data like this later on. Um, OK, so now we've gotten the point sources. We've exposed people to what's out there. We've given them some sometimes dramatic examples of what's going on. How do we keep going from here? Well, we've got to educate them. We've got to really show them how you can do an instructional design process, uh, begin to get the word out there. right? So you've got to train for these different components. So, and it's not easy to do that. So we've put in place a whole set of training pieces, beginning from the insight that many instructional designers have learned over decades, which is you got to do backwards design. You've got to start from the learning outcomes. And again, I'm preaching to the choir here. Many, many faculty start by teaching what they teach, as opposed to thinking very deeply about, what do I want students to be able to decide and do when I'm done? with this course, this month, this week, this day? What, what do I want them to walk away able to decide and do differently? And tying that deeply into the activities they design and what they actually say. So it's, it's actually an innovation for most faculty and most teaching environments, even arguably for many publishing environments, to really start from those learning outcomes and work backwards. And then, of course, you deliver forwards. right? So to get people able to do that, you know, you, you need to also provide frameworks for how to think about the instructional design you're going to do that are practical. So we borrowed something from uh, Carnegie Mellon, actually, uh, Ken Katinger's uh, group. They call it the KLI framework. And we made a sort of a simplified form of this, which I'll describe to you now. And, and many of you may have seen something like this. Ba you guys have um, uh, 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 seen other uh, you know, uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy kinds of frameworks before. This is an attempt to make a taxonomy of learning outcomes that's linked to learning science, rather than sort of a, the Bloom's taxonomy was a bit like Aristotelian physics. It was an armchair exercise in trying to guess at how outcomes should be classified. And it, it wasn't bad. It just didn't match the evidence, because they had no evidence when they were doing the work. Now there's evidence, so we can refine the insights. And that's what I think uh, Ken Katinger's group tried to do. So the key thing at the top level are complex cognitive procedures. You know, Write a one-page synthesis of 10 pages of stuff. Right? So it's not simple. This is complex cognitive procedures. And lots of careers and courses and other things, they're made up of a whole series of these complex cognitive procedures. We want students to be able to decide and do problem solving and writing and analysis and all kinds of things. And so you've got to do that. I mean, you can't 
you, you have to have practice and feedback on that, right? But to do any of these complex cognitive procedures, you need to do some subsidiary things as well. You need something about facts. You're going to teach something about concepts, maybe processes, possibly principles, especially for upper level courses where you're teaching people to deal with uncertainty. And each of these is very different in how an expert mind uses them and also the learning that's needed uh, based on the evidence. So facts are facts, right? What's the capital of the United States, et cetera? And really good ways to do that are, in fact, these spaced uh, memorization approaches, spaced repetition that lots of people know about. It also turns out you really want to practice them in a work-like context. Because if you practice your French vocabulary in a quiet white room off of little sheets of paper, when you're in a bustling social setting, it turns out the context isn't helping you to bring up those words. If you practice in the kind of a context you're going to be in, it turns out the context helps pull the, 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 the facts up too. So you want to practice in a work-like context. Um, uh, concepts, things like classifying mechanics problems as either energy problems or mom momentum problems, experts use concepts to simplify their work, to try to break down a complex situation into recognizable chunks, and then they often have schema, analytic frameworks that they can then apply very quickly sometimes once they recognize, oh, it's an energy problem. Well, I know then you know, what to pay attention to and what not to, right? So, uh, and all the way through here. And, and each of these then has its own kind of practice that actually makes a difference uh, 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 to it that we then train our instructional designers on how to first recognize and classify learning outcomes. And sometimes you realize you have to split them up, that you may have several things in one learning outcome, and you're going to need to split it up into a complex cognitive procedure and some subsidiary things, especially for the hardest, most important outcomes, because those are the ones you want to spend the most time actually working through. So assessments as well, building these, you need some kind of a process or an architecture for this. And so we've drawn on the modern psychometric approaches to designing these things where you sort out the purpose of the assessment, you make sure you've got the objectives clarified and matched to the overall decision-making purpose of the, uh, of the assessment itself. You figure out what are the tasks that really probe, um, uh, and, and they're very likely to be performance tasks, is what we're finding in lots of things, uh, the, uh, the objectives you're after. And because often you're going to have performance tasks, you then need to have really well-designed rubrics. And a lot of the rubrics that people make very quickly, you've all seen them. They have like a five-point scale and you know, six attributes. And then they have little paragraphs in each cell that describe what is a two for this dimension, right? And inevitably, any of you have used those. You know you're looking at this piece of work, and you look at this rubric, and you're saying, well, it's a two because of this, but it's really a three because of that, and it's kind of a four because of this other thing. So I guess I'll just go in the middle and pick a three. And you end up with something that is either mushy, because everything looks like a three out of five, or it's actually unreliable, because different people decide, well, I guess I'll go with the top one. I'll take the best thing, and they go with a four instead of a three. So there are ways in the psychometric world to make these more valid and reliable. They especially involve breaking that paragraph up into individual short statements. And instead of one through five, you mark it absent present, zero, one. It turns out that is much more reliable. Now, you still have to train people on what does present mean. But at least you're working on smaller snippets. And once you do it at that level, you can roll it up however you like. Right? But now you have valid and reliable empirical rubric data underneath what you're doing that you can demonstrate is integrated, reliable, and so forth and so on. Your weightings and what you choose for a grade versus mastery, whatever, now you have the raw stuff to actually go ahead and do that. But the rubric thing, there's some real work that you can do to make these actually be more effective and therefore useful for things like experiments. Um, then you got to figure out your reporting plan. How are you going to uh, analyze this and, and get the data out? Because part of this is you're after action. And so if you just dump raw data on a teacher or an administrator or even a student, they don't know what to do with it. So what's the reporting method that ties to action in a clear way? And lastly, once you have these things put together, what's your validation strategy? How are you going to look to see, are we measuring what we intended? Does it hang together longitudinally? with other data that we're collecting so that, yeah, I, I th we think we've got it. We have evidence that we're actually probing what's going on inside that head. 
um, which is the non-trivial part of all of this. You can't see learning very easily. And so you're looking at evidence to confirm or deny a hypothesis that Brohr has actually learned some math for once in his life. Um, so to, to, to push all of these kinds of frameworks, you need some training. And you need, it, uh, our, at least in our hands, it's been pretty extensive. So we've created a whole range of training modules. We actually did create a cognitive task analysis module, which is sadly underutilized, I'm just saying. Um, we also created a fairly large 30-hour uh, uh, virtual module on instructional design that basically every instructional designer who comes to Kaplan goes through. And we created a, a group of smaller four-hour blocks on various important aspects of assessment design, depending on what people needed to do. Uh, blueprints or uh, multiple choice items or uh, you know, assessing complex knowledge with multiple choice items. Um, we're uh, building out the short answer and performance task work because we're, we're actually, that thousand Kaplan University courses I mentioned that we're converting, every one of those is going to have competency-based performance task assessment at the end of it. So that means literally thousands of items are being designed by hundreds of faculty as we speak. Uh, against a training setup that we put together for them on how to do this better in the way I described with the zero ones and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's real at scale work. And then the validation work, uh, you know, how do you, how do you actually validate? That's a piece that we're, we're training on. So, you know, shouldn't, I mean, again, these people have minds. You can't expect that by reading Clark and Mayer, they're gonna get it right from the beginning. You actually have to do the practice and feedback work. You have to counsel, you have to get more expert folks looking at it, giving them advice and you build the competence in the community over time. Um, and uh, you know, one example of the kind of thing we did was a multi-day workshop uh, after the online training. It was a multi-day workshop with groups of instructional designers who then worked together to build out slowly, slowly uh, a piece of instruction following the actual frameworks that we described, the backwards design principles, coached by people who knew what they were doing so that as they hit the practical, wait a minute, well, how am I supposed to apply this here? They had folks who could walk them through it because this is, this is real engineering work. It requires coaching and feedback and problem solving and all of this. Um, and so this made a lot of difference to those teams when they were then going back to their regular product line. Some of them even took back segments they had built and were able to use them. But the main point was just the training piece itself. But you can't undercook this. These are human beings and brand new skills often trying to override burned in habits. We don't have a delete key for bad burned in behaviors. And that's a real problem when you're dealing with very experienced faculty, instructional designers, and others. Love to do this, obviously, at the very beginning of, uh, of training, you know, in uh, graduate school and elsewhere, but often that's not our choice. So it takes real effort to do this. Um, so effort. So now we, you know, now you've got the education, you've begun to train up our instructional designers, they begin to know what to do, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be allowed to do it, right? That's one of those issues. So, we then began looking at lots of different products across Kaplan. These are the sort of nine different high volume products. The names have been redacted to protect the innocent or otherwise. Um, and we used a checklist uh, that, is, uh, that was well designed. Uh, we used, designed it with the Gates Foundation and it has evidence it's iterator reliable. It's actually part of the Department of Education uh, EdTech Developers Handbook. Um, and we looked at a bunch of these high volume courses. And, as an engineering matter, you should not expect everything to be dark blue, which would mean perfect on all dimensions. Because from an engineering perspective, doing good personalization is potentially very expensive. And so it's not the first thing you're gonna try to do. You may not be able to afford to do it. So, however, the fact that three of those high volume courses had basically no declared objectives at all was a sin. I mean, you know, how could that happen? Right? Well, it's easy to see. Guy rolls up, yeah, I'm gonna teach, I'm an expert, let me start teaching. Okay, bro, why don't you just start teaching? Ah, that's the first course. Who's gonna do the second course? And off you go. And it's like, but no idea, it's like, no. And there's no excuse, because it's not a gigantic media burden to write down a bunch of sentences, right? It's like, come on, people, now it is, thinking burden, but it's only of a few people. So that's a problem. And then they look at the assessment line too. I mean, that's a little light. 
And this was several years ago. But again, this created the energy within Kaplan for our CEO, our CFO, some other of the senior managers when they realized, you're kidding. This is where we're at, having started in the 1930s. We're 80 years into this, and we have these kinds of holds. Right? So this creates energy in an organization. And again, I, I should say, you know, Kaplan, you know, Kaplan's vision about learning and why it's valuable is it used to be you had to pay for a bad education. Okay? Now a bad education is free. Right? You can go online, unending videos on YouTube, not of course the MIT X videos or the Harvard X videos, but or, or MOOCs. But there are some MOOCs, many of you will agree with me, that are not very high quality. I mean, all of yours are perfect. Okay? <laughs> I'm just saying, just for illustration purposes, OK? And so there's a lot of bad stuff out there which has the advantage of being totally free, right? So the dead hand of Keynes is going to crush you if you are charging for things that are no better than stuff that is free. Now, it might take 10 years or 20 years, but you are dead as a business if you think you can keep charging for stuff that's as bad as what's free. And honestly, Free is getting less bad. It's going to get better. That means you, we, as, a, as Kaplan, we have to stay ahead of the rising tide. Otherwise, there's no business left. That means either we've got to be better at achieving learning outcomes, we've got to have better learning outcomes, we've got to be able to get to those outcomes faster and more efficiently than the free stuff, at least, not to mention our competitors. But that creates the business strategic driver for investment. I'm just explaining this because universities have other issues and ways of thinking about this. But from a business standpoint, this is the reason the board of directors says th this can't just sit around because it will get drowned. So this was a bunch of years ago. We looked at this and we said, we got to get moving. And that was helpful. And so we began changing courses, making redesigns, even in high volume stuff like the Kaplan University courses. Um, I, I won't go through this in detail. Um, but uh, uh, you know, we, we redesigned the online learning courses from a kind of a conventional online learning approach uh, that was kind of a read-write-discuss approach to one that was much more focused tightly on each lesson was tied to a specific learning outcome with specific ass assessments. If you wanted somebody to practice two learning outcomes, you made another lesson where they practiced the two learning outcomes together. So it was actually very uh, specifically designed. We added motivation detectors and triggers and reports that went to faculty so they knew if we had data from interactions that a student looked like they were you know, punking out, that they were just like losing steam. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then we did some multimedia work to actually make sure that uh, you know, we were trying to follow some of the Clark and Mayer principles rather than violate them. So in doing that, we generated in a randomized controlled trial with almost 1,000 students uh, spread across uh, three different courses each very different and then designed using these same principles, we were able to get a, you know, a students to be more than one and a half times uh, their success rates, where success was defined as uh, passing the course, mastering the critical learning outcomes. For each course, we had a set of learning outcomes that were critical, and coming back. They had to come back or it wasn't a success, right? And so this made a big difference. And again, more evidence, you know, we got to keep going because this really helps students. And, and so, and you know, once you have scale like this, and you have some evidence that makes a difference, you can start to run a bunch of tests. So we have a, a composition course that will have 1,000 students a month starting. That's the advantage of a virtual course, right? They start in January, they start in February, et cetera, and it's big. So in theory, we should do five randomized control trials in January, right? Five trials, 200 students each. And then do another file at five in February and March. And who knows, maybe in April, if the results are back fast enough and we're nimble, we should do a next iteration on the first five, right? And off you go. So that one course, in theory, we should get 60 randomized control trials out per year. We should be able to break the back of the writing problem in America in a decade or so, if we can work at this pace. Now, we're not quite at this pace. My colleagues get scared when I talk like this, right? But, but this is the point, right? This is the potential, right, to do this. And 
they're already doing a whole range of experiments in all kinds of areas at Kaplan University because they have many courses at that scale. So they are running dozens of randomized controlled trials across many courses, right? And so they're looking at improving the assessment. They're looking at the motivation issues. They've been doing some of the social norming work, the, the work example work they've been trying uh, as well. So lots of different things to try once you have a place where you can start to schedule hundreds of randomized controlled trials. We dedicated a bunch of slots to the Stanford guys, PERTS, the people who work with Carol Dweck. It's a really good team that connects researchers in the kind of uh, affective domain with people who have data at scale. And so we've run repeated trials of some of the, uh, the, the Carol Dweck uh, type interventions uh, within the Kaplan University randomized control trial system because we just allocate it. We can schedule them out and then off we go. Um, we've all been banging our heads on the table about that because it hasn't worked as well as it does in other institutions, right? But that's engineering, right? You, you know, there's, well, the active ingredient is there for some. So you've got to figure out, are we delivering the active ingredient at all or is it that we don't have the problem that the others have, right? So there's things to work out when it doesn't work. You don't just walk away. Um, and you have to do this work. You have to really do the engineering work to dig into this because it's not obvious how it's gonna turn out. So big idea, give faculty dashboards to look for high-risk students. Great idea, all right? So we gave one kind of dashboard uh, that was based on attendance. Are students attending their, uh, their weekly seminar series? They have a weekly synchronous uh, class session with their faculty in this virtual university. And you know what we got was uh, we got uh, improved retention results so that students, when you use the dashboard based on attendance and faculty barely burrowed in on attendance, you actually got an improvement in retention but not actually in learning outcomes. Okay, okay, let's try another one. So this was based on the minutes that students spent in the learning management system, because we had that as a variable we could pick. This was, this was e-college. It, it doesn't give you much data, but it gave us that at least. And again, we said, let's look, let's look. And so flagged who was not spending time. Teachers interacted, responded. And, and here, we didn't get improved retention, but we did get improved learning outcomes. OK, OK, well, OK. And so, Final thing we tried was the number of assignments. So they have a bunch of assignments they have to deliver, right, and deadlines for them. So if they don't deliver them, that becomes a detector. And look, Goldilocks, we got both. We got an, uh, a lift in the, uh, in the retention and a lift in the learning outcomes. Now, nobody could really predict that ahead of time, how this was gonna work. And it's still a little unclear why are they so different one from another but remember, I'm doing this for engineering purposes, right? So I'm gonna take the thing on the right and run with it, and then we'll keep working to see can we do it better. But you have to test in the wild, because whatever you thought was going on in the lab or some other uh, institution, it's not the same as your own people, your own context. You have to collect your own data. Um, another aspect of the effort involved, we have 150 instructional designers across Kaplan and a bunch of measurement people and a bunch of other people interested in this. So, to get them all engaged in this, we actually created a formal entity, the learning architect community. Some of my more humanities-oriented people don't like being called engineers because they think it means, you know, the grease-stained onesies with a hammer, and they don't like that thing, right? So, so they don't want to be engineers, but they kind of like architects because, you know, they got the, 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 the funny painted glasses and the big high-ceilinged offices, so they like the architect thing. So we call them learning architects. Um, and so learning architect community, and then there are subgroups of this. So we'll have a measurement council that has all the measurement people around Kaplan who do that work everywhere, who deal with common issues, find problems, set up training. We have a steering committee of people for that, and then we have individual working groups as well. So it, it, that's real effort, and again, your organization has to reward that effort. Your managers have to say, I want you guys to talk to each other. That was non-trivial to get going because our history was very balkanized learning organizations, but this has made a big difference because these guys working together and talking together means they start to share ideas and language and all of that. Um, and then what we've been doing most recently over the last year is training the general managers. The general managers allocate capital, resources, headcount, so they have to also be able to reason about learning and learning priorities at their level in the same way that they reason about real estate or uh, sales or marketing or any of those things. They don't have to be experts, but they have to be able to reason about it 
and know enough about the state of the art to get the right things in the right order. So we began running uh, uh, meetings with our general managers and our global CEO. So that was the key commitment. Our global CEO said, I will twice a year spend a half an hour to an hour with every one of our 23 business unit heads at a meeting with each of them to talk only about learning priorities, learning strategies, learning investments. Now, even presidents of universities don't typically sit down with their department chairman twice a year for an hour each and talk about learning priorities, learning results, learning challenges, learning trade-offs, right? So this needs to happen to really get a learning engineering process going because those are the people who allocate resources and capital and can, when they get excited about a learning result from the evidence, they put more resources against it. And so we need those folks to be engaged in all this. And so we set up meetings with different uh, focuses. We focused on learning outcomes assessment and instructional design. Last September, just we just finished a couple of weeks ago, uh, a focus on what are your pilots going to be like? What are your evidence-based pilots going to be like? And how are you going to do it? And we're coming up uh, for next September something about now. How are you going to use the data from your delivery in intelligent ways to refine your pilots and your assessments and all this kind of stuff? Um, and and uh, uh, you know, the, the key thing is not everyone is at the same place. The goal is have them all create a good path forward. How fast they go down that path is gated by their own business results. That's OK. That's fine. But they should have a good path that connects up to all this evidence-based work we're talking about. Um, so the last thing is some evaluation pieces here. And, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. As I mentioned, we have a checklist that we created that is being used by all our instructional designers inside Kaplan to evaluate their own work. But also, they're evaluating each other's work. So an instructional designer from Kaplan Test Prep is actually going across to English language learning and applying the same framework to their learning products. Well, that does two things. One, it gives an impartial view of the English language learning product. But sneaky, sneaky, remember, instructional designers have brains too. We're forcing them to use these concepts and ideas in a novel situation. It cements it even deeper into that reviewing instructional designer's brain so that when they come back and are working on something that's due at 5 PM, these ideas and, and pieces are more likely to boop, pop right up instead of, yeah, there was something on that list, but I don't have time to look it up because I've got to get home for dinner. And so this is actually helpful for that purpose as well. And we have a whole series of uh, reporting pieces that we do where they actually brainstorm with the, other, with, with the people they're reviewing about what would be the most important things to change next, what would be the most important things to change just within your resources as well as if you had some more resources. So that's real work. That takes you know, several you know, man days per instructional designer for every instructional designer around Kaplan to do that. But it pays these benefits for the product and for their own skills as well. Um, this is what I mentioned before. This is what we call the research pipeline from Kaplan University. They've run something close to 150 randomized control trials over the last two or three years. And they've then looked. This was done actually last year, uh, or about a little over a year ago now, a year and a half ago. And they actually ended up with what is a pipeline, a, a, you know, an actual portfolio here. And you can see the biggest bars here in, in these several areas, improved persistence, improved learning, some data reliability, and cost reduction stuff. The biggest bars are the ones where we haven't gotten to a good conclusion, but we're not done yet. Basically, basically the gray bar is the confused bar. It's like, but you're not, you're not done. You're not done. And then you have some things where you have a definite recommendation not to implement. The data is clear. It doesn't work. Well, for us in, in engineering, that is just as important as the positive ones that say definitely do it. And so that, that's exactly what we have to you know, look at and manage then over time. And yeah, mostly we're confused, but we get some good results that we roll out, and we're prevented from doing things that looked promising but were not. So that's actually really valuable to us. This is an example on assessments. Uh, these are point by serial correlations from a large test bank that we've used for years in one of our healthcare offerings. The red uh, distribution are uh, the point by serial correlations uh, for the old data bank, that, data bank that we had. And what this means, the fact that these numbers are lower, means basically that the items don't distinguish very well for high performers and low performers. 
that there, there's a lot of confusion in many of these items, that guys who are high performers might not actually get them right because they got confused about something, and people who are low performers might have gotten them right, but not for good reasons. So when, they, when the team saw the data for the first time, they said, well, that's not good. And so they went through a whole revision cycle of changing out, editing, modifying, and they've ended up now with a much healthier looking uh, set of uh, items. And, and you have to run the items through people. You can't, even the best item writers at, at ACT or ETS, 30 or 40 percent of their items get thrown out when they actually put them to the test of real work. Um, this is another example, uh, sorry about the eye chart. It plots item difficulty, this is classical test theory stuff, item difficulty versus item discrimination. And anything that's kind of you know, off on the edges needs looking at, because it doesn't look right. They're either too hard, they're too easy. Huh. The few that are negative discriminations, it means if you are better, you are more likely to get this item wrong. Well, that can't be good. Right? Now, that could just be an answer key problem. Right? We put the wrong answer in. Right? So the, right? But whatever it is, it's a thing to look at. And again, these tools coming out of psychometrics help you go back into your complex data sets and say, whoa, 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 we got to fix this. And now you can engineer what this looks like over time, which is part of the engineering side of this thing. So all of this matters if you want to really do good learning engineering at scale. You got to expose people to it. You have to educate them. You got to get ready to put in effort and get your managers to actually assign honest to goodness resources against it. And then finally, you got to keep looking because the real world gives you the best clue about what to focus on next. Thank you very much for your time. So I left a couple minutes for questions. I don't know if people want to ask desperately difficult things that I have very little time to answer, and so I can dodge them. Yes? It's a great question. The question, uh, uh, yeah, the question is about. Um, I spoke about validity and reliability, and the question is, what about fairness? What about issues of uh, demographic inequality and geographic inequality, and a whole range of things like that? And um, I think to us, those fit in. Those fit in with the validity issues. They're a part of this point of making sure that we really are looking at uh, mastery of learning outcomes, as opposed to items that are understood one way by one group and another way by another group. So that's, that's, to me, that's within the validity piece of it. Um, to, uh, we, have, we do have this international population of students around the globe. I have to be honest, we haven't done a lot of digging specifically into, uh, well, there's trivial demographic issues that we think are not relevant. Like, yes, we know lower SES, they do worse, and a bunch of things of race, and so everybody's got these things, right? But those are not operational things for us. I, I, one, they probably are not the actual cause of a learning problem, right? Where somebody's zip code is, is not the cause in their brain of a learning problem. I mean, maybe lead poisoning, we could make this up. But, but really, how they lived and their, their circumstances have conspired probably to give either something in the cognitive domain, missing elements, or positive elements in their mastery of things, or in the motivation domain, beliefs about learning or, or things that are in their way or things they think that are in their way that may be different. And those are things we can then act on. So our focus has really been on what can we act on. So we haven't done that much sort of patterning based around the demographic variables and so forth, as opposed to trying to get at root causes that we can change, I think. So I don't have a satisfactory answer for you for that. So uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, I liked your talk. But uh, secondly, the metrics that you seem to be using are class-wide metrics, by and large. You know, their retention there, the fraction of people who pass. Have you been doing more detailed studies 
where you look at the learning of individuals, say how they did at the beginning, how they do at the end, and which of your resources they seem to be benefiting more from or things like that. Yeah, that's, that is uh, on the way, and I'll be honest, we have been limited by the quality of data generated by some of the tools that we've had in place. We are now replacing those tools, especially we're putting in a D2L now as the learning engine for our Kaplan University. That should give us much richer information about interaction data. The other piece for us, uh, it depends. I, I mean, I didn't sh show it. We have a very well-designed English language learning adaptive assessment that has, uh, it's an IRT-based uh, system that has five different scales of English language performance. I'm trying to think it's grammar and vocabulary and speaking and listening, and I'm missing one. And that is being used in detail to understand both where should we place students when they come into our English language learning program, but also the progress they're making. I didn't show the slide, but we, we just recently at these April meetings, um, they were able to show conclusively that much of their learning is working very well, but the higher end of what they're doing, they're not getting as much lift as they want. And so that's where they're going to focus their next year of development work is to make sure the higher end of English language learning can actually show the same growth. And they trust these measures because they know the validity and reliability work that have gone into the IRT-based item bank system with a 1,000 of these things and so forth and so on. So it just depends business by business where we're at. The goal is, like with the Kaplan University learning outcome work, to have learning outcomes for every two weeks of instruction that are strong enough that they could be used as the focus of a randomized control trial if we wanted to do it. So we're, we're on our way. It's just a massive change to do that. So, but that's the intent. That's the intent. Oh, yes. Um, Neil. Neil Heffernan, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, Borg Killer Talk. Um, the negative examples of things that you guys decided not to implement, um, um, how do we, well, I want to learn about those, because uh, I'm sure some of those are actually, the field is wrong. Uh, um, how do we get those results actually out so that we actually, the rest of us can know about those good negative results too? That, that's a great question. So there's, there is both a very specific question like Kaplan, what, what can we do to get what we've done out? But there's a bigger question, which is a really important one, which is how do we get negative results to be accessible? Uh, because publishing folks have a really strong bias towards positive results because positive is sexy, okay? Now, my view is negative is sexy because we're not wasting our time, but a lot of people don't see it that way, right? So I actually think there's a, a missing thing, place, framework, holder, something where positive and negative results can go live and then be accessed, and they can point to research articles, but that th there's a place where things could go. And of course, you have to figure out some peer review things and make sure people aren't you know, putting up garbage for competitive nastiness or whatever. But you know, some peer reviewed place where it all goes would be enormously valuable. And I wonder if there are any funders in the room, hello, uh, you know, if that would be something that would really help advance the learning engineering uh, work is, is to become more neutral to say, look, for learning engineering, it's just as valuable to know what not to try to do as it is to know what to try to do and to build on. So, uh, so I'm with you on that. In terms of our own results, a lot of our results, we're still confused. And so many of them, and many of them worked somewhere else. They just didn't work in our hands, in our populations. And so, we, you know, they're helpful to us. Whether they'd be helpful to others, I don't know. But again, if there were a place to put stuff like this, we could put stuff that had the conditions to say, for this kind of student in this virtual environment like this, this didn't seem to work, even though it works over there. And I'm happy to point to, I mean, we're not doing stuff for the fun of it. We're doing it because it worked somewhere else. So we know it, that's why we did it. We know it worked somewhere else. We just haven't been able to get it to work yet. And we've still got a couple of those things where we're not done yet. We, they haven't worked in various iterations, but we, we still are, there's a pony in there somewhere. We just got to dig him out. Um, anything else or another question or if? Maybe if I'm. You, you control well, time, the, so go ahead and pick, pick somebody. Go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have one more question and then I'm just gonna I'll tell people that you'll be here yeah. tomorrow. So there'll, yeah. be, there'll be plenty of opportunities to talk to Broer. Um, Tim O'Shea from the University of Edinburgh. Oh, that, that was a really superb talk. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm an old-time educational technologist. You, you, you talked a lot about um, how to engineer uh, and improve what you teach. I'd be very interested to know um, how Kaplan chooses what to teach. I mean, at my own place, we you know, find ourselves 
Lots and lots of, many more students want to study philosophy and classics than we're expecting. There are other things where we would expect lots of people to come and they don't come. So how, how do you decide what to teach? Uh, what a great question, an important one. For us, it depends on the learning uh, uh, organization inside Kaplan. So some of them, it's really obvious. Test prep, mm, we know what we're after. We want a higher score for the MCAT. It's not so hard, right? We got that. Um, some of them, like Kaplan University, um, it, it's, it's harder. And what we're trying to do is engage with industry partners. So most of Kaplan Universities, and we don't have people doing classics, for example, I'm just saying. and so. Our work is mostly practical, kind of connected to careers and professions in healthcare and business and IT and so forth. So we have the opportunity, and I would argue the obligation, to go and find out and talk to the folks who hire our grads and say, how are we doing? What are we missing? What do we need to do? And that obligation is going to go up. As an interesting example of that, we actually own a boot camps. We own developers boot camp in San Francisco, which is one of the earliest uh, software coding boot camps, you know, intense environments for programming, computer programming. And one of the key things they did very early was they, you know, their short fuse courses, you know, like 20 weeks. They followed students into the workplace, and they discovered they were spending too much time teaching students many programming languages. That the company said, this, I, you were trying to do the good thing, but we just have to teach them yet another programming language when they get here, because none of the ones you're teaching them, they're, they're going to disappear. So stop that. Teach one really great programming language that they then use for everything else to learn later but spend more time teaching them how to work on small teams with people they won't have a beer with later. Because it turns out, you know, I, I have to be careful I'm at MIT, but uh, apparently in other parts of the world, many people who do computer programming work are not nearly as social and interesting as all of your colleagues here at MIT. Like, I'm really scared now. Okay. So, and, and so that, that turns out to be critical for professionals. They have intense teams, two people, check in, check out, split the work, collaborate, problem solve, ba 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 ba. thank you, let's move on to the next one. And you, you've got to become good at that. And there's a real set of skills for that. So they took the time they were spending on two extra computer languages and they turned it into very systematic project work where they, everybody, you know, like every day or two ratcheted around a wheel to work with somebody else to make sure that everybody was really working with somebody else very intensively over a two or, two or three day period. Um, and that seems to have been helpful. They're still struggling with this. We have another boot camp on data sciences and yeesh, not even the companies know what they mean when they use the word data sciences. So this is a really fun exercise. And the key thing, and I just had this conversation with the, uh, the general manager there, which is the fact that it's hard to define what the right learning outcomes are for data sciences doesn't mean you don't need learning outcomes to design your instruction. It just means you're going to pick a set of learning outcomes. There's going to be risk in that. And then you rigorously design instruction against the learning outcomes you picked. So you don't just superly wade into a lecture on data sciences. You just you pick a set of learning outcomes, and then you adjust as rapidly as you can. And you have a core set. You have some optional ones. You have some you leave off the table and hope you pick the right one. And then you change it from there. Um, but that notion of focusing first on what are those tight statements what do you want your students to be able to decide and do differently when they're done with this piece of instruction or program? That's that critical first step. And then getting the feedback in, I would argue, from industry or experts or the research community if a person is being trained to be a, res a researcher and so forth. So, so. OK, so bro, I'm going to be a little bit of a pain. OK. What were your learning outcomes for us for the talk you just gave? Yeah, I should have come clean early. I just thought I'd talk, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Actually, the main thing, and I, I hope it came out in the framework, was uh, the need to lift our sights, some of us anyway, from the, the onesie twosie work on specific uh, uh, engagements and courses and outcomes and instructional designs to begin to think systematically about how are we going to change dozens, hundreds of our colleagues' work habits and expectations. And you know what's needed? Who else needs to become involved in that beyond researchers, even learning engineers? And that was the main thing I wanted to get across, is that this is a bigger thing than 
the individual uh, details of how you do evidence-based learning and instructional design, which is critical and a key input, but there's a bigger puzzle that we're all gonna have to tackle if we really wanna transform how learning works for most of humanity, really. Thank you so much, Rorik, joining me and thanking for it.